When I was nine years old, our third grade school teacher read us a child's biography of Mozart because it was the 200th anniversary of Mozart's birth, 1956. I was just entranced by the idea of a young boy who could write music and I decided that year when I was nine years old that I wanted to be a composer. The problem was that I, I went back home that afternoon after the first chapter had been read to us and I got some paper and pencil and a, and a ruler and I went out in the field behind our house where I thought it would be a proper inspirational place to compose and drew five lines on the paper and then suddenly realized to my horror that I didn't know what I was doing. I had a very, very strong fantasy life as an adolescent that I was going to be in a sense, the person I am right now, that I was going to be an American composer, and that my being, my way of being in American culture would be expressed through through my music. I, I think that's kind of an amazing thing, that, that, yes. that this model already existed in my mind uh, as, as a 10-year-old. I've been familiar with the work of John Adams since his early days as one of the uh, underground left coast phenoms. You have been highly identified with the West Coast and California and, and that as a certain aesthetic there. But as your recent recording makes very clear, you have your roots here in New England. My mother was uh, born in Boston and my father was born in Shrewsbury. They met at Weir's Beach, New Hampshire, uh, where my mother's stepfather owned a dance hall. It was called Irwin's Winnipesaukee Gardens. And my father was playing in a swing band about 1933-34. They met and they eloped and lived in various towns in New England. Um, I was born in Worcester, but shortly after my birth, my parents moved first to Woodstock, Vermont, and then to a very tiny town, East Concord, New Hampshire, where, where I spent most of my childhood until I left to go to college. So these roots are not shallow roots. They're quite deep in your uh, personal history and also in your music. Well, how could they not be with my name? <laughs> <laughs> I, I went to public schools in, in Concord, New Hampshire, um, but my you know, there was lots of music in, in the household. My mother was a, a very talented singer. Uh, she couldn't read music. She would had no training, but she just had tremendous intuitive uh, uh, feel for music, and I really think that's where my talent came from. My father had studied clarinet as a young man, and his college roommate turned out to be the uh, bass clarinet player of the Boston Symphony, Rosario Mazzeo, who was hired by Kusevitsky and for many years... Uh, was one of the principal figures in the Boston classical music scene. So I studied clarinet with my father. I played in, in marching bands. Uh, Concord, New Hampshire, even to this day, has a professional marching band, Never's Second Regiment <laughs> Band. I played in that. I played in the New Hampshire Philharmonic, which was conducted by Roland Tapley, who for 50-some-odd years was a violinist in the Boston Symphony. I took theory lessons, came down to Boston on Saturdays, and then uh, I went to Harvard, where I studied composition with um, Leon Kirshner, David Del Tredici, Harold Shapiro, Earl Kim, and even for one semester with uh, Roger Sessions. And one important part of your background, or at least as you look back on it from today, is pointed out in your one of your newest compositions, your father knew Charles Ives. <laughs> we'll come back to that later on, Helen. <clears throat> At what point was it and what motivated you to go west, young man? I had been uh, at Harvard for, for six years, an undergraduate and two years of, uh, of graduate school, and it was, um, it was a very intense time to be on any campus. It was, you know, the late 60s, and, um, you know, between the explosion of the drug culture and psychedelia and the Vietnam War, 
uh, you know, it was a, a really very turbulent time. Um, most of my colleagues and the, you know, young composers uh, were interested in going to Europe, you know, studying with Stockhausen or Boulez or something right. like that. And I had no interest in that. I, I had no interest in atonal music or serialism, which was very, very de rigueur in those days. And I had been reading the beat poets. I'd been reading Allen Ginsberg and, and Gary Snyder and Kerouac. And, and California seemed like a, a paradise, a, you know, a strange paradise. A happening but, place. Yeah. And, you know, the California bands like Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead, um, all of that culture. Plus, I knew a little bit about composers like Lou Harrison and John Cage, um, and it seemed like the right place for me. So I went out on a exploratory trip. I didn't expect to stay more than six months. This was 1972, uh, and I never came back. The first year I was out there, I worked in a warehouse on the Oakland waterfront, and I was very confused. I, I had a fantasy that I would um, be a kind of, um, you know, blue-collar worker during the day, and then come back and, and compose sort of <laughs> John Cage avant-garde music at a night. Real American. But in fact, I would come back and I would be so exhausted from the physical labor um, of working in the warehouse that I'd just crash, you know, and, and, and not be able to do much of anything. Um, and then through pure luck, absolute uh, happenstance, I, I heard about a, uh, a job opening conducting avant-garde music and, and teaching composition at a very small school, the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. And I took the job. I interviewed for it, and um, they were looking for a bargain. And there was this <laughs> young guy who nobody had heard of who'd come from the East Coast and was living in Oakland. And... and uh, they took a long shot on me. I was very influenced by Cage at the time, and I think partly it was just a way of staking out my personal territory because um, I really felt that, that music, um, classical contemporary music in the United States and in Europe, had reached a terrible cul-de-sac um, where the gap between um, the audience and the, and the composer or, if you want to put it this way, between the producer and the consumer, had become one of such great distrust. Um, it had reached a really pathological situation. And, uh, you know, I'm amused even today when great conductors still feel that the aesthetic of the early 70s, um, you know, serialism and, and atonality is still the cutting edge mm -hmm. because this is this was something that was clear in the early 70s. It was a dead end. It's old school, really, now. Well, it, you know, it's not a question of fashion being in fashion or out of fashion. It's just simply that um, it, it was a, an expressive direction that really was yielding less and less fruits. It yielded fruits in the time of Schoenberg and Baird, but you know, up through lig Ligeti, but then after that it really was petering out. And I wanted to get away from that aesthetic, and I felt that even being on the East Coast, you know, even being in Cambridge or, or New York was, was not a healthy thing for me. So I went to the West Coast because I felt it was a sufficient distance. And um, after a while I got tired of Cage because I thought as, as much fun as it was doing these, these John Cage events, <laughs> they, they somehow weren't satisfying. And I'd go home at night and put on Miles Davis or, or Beethoven piano sonatas to sort of feed my soul. And then I finally said, well, there's something wrong with this picture. I really have to find a way of, of uh, making music that feels new but also um, has deep, deep spiritual meaning. The first recording, really, that I know of that you came out with was Phrygian Gates um, there was this little label called Arch 1750, as I recall, who 
uh, in its short-lived span, came out with some very interesting things by composers that were not well-known. Phrygian Gates got you nailed as a minimalist, although a minimalist who didn't behave well, because <laughs> um, you, uh, you did weird things like mm -hmm. veering this way and that, mm -hmm. uh, surprising things. ever think of yourself as a minimalist or of that school? Well, hearing minimalist music was this tremendous shock for me, um, and it was it was a pleasurable shock because it really pointed in a direction out of that terrible cul-de-sac that I was, I found myself in. You know, I, I, I had no interest in East Coast atonal, 12-tone music, um, and uh, I was losing interest in Cage, and then I, I heard those classic early minimalist pieces in C by Terry Riley, drumming by Steve Reich, and Einstein on the Beach by Glass, and I felt that this was a way that I could find these sort of essential building blocks of the musical experience, pulsation, tonality, and repetition, all of which had been systematically banished by, by the serialists, uh, by Schoenberg and his successors. Right and create something that, that was new and sounded fresh, but also had this um, fundamental, what I would call a kind of musical lingua franca, you know, that throughout the world, people can appreciate this essential sound. So yes, my first works were fairly obviously influenced. Phrygian Gates is, is the most minimalist of pieces of mine. But as you say, you know, there was something always very restless about my musical self. And what I didn't like about minimalism was its sort of mechanical rigor. In the hands of a master like Steve Reich, you can have mechanical r rigor and a sort of ecstatic beauty at his yes. best. But I wanted a music that was more dramatic, that had highs and lows and sudden shifts of you know, sort of the kind of experiences you'll get in a Mahler symphony where, where there'll be a shock, uh, just a sudden change. And so that was the beginning of my own personal um, uh, musical language. <laughs> So much of the music of the 20th century was about reacting to the 19th century, like we want to sever ourselves from all of that completely and find our own thing. But you as a composer have always, your music has shown that there's something from the classical period that's valuable, there's something from the romantic period that's valuable, there's something from in the early 20th century music that's valuable. As a composer, you can bring all that together to make well, your own voice. Maybe, maybe I was the first iPod composer long <laughs> before the iPod was invented. Uh, but, you know, I, I did grow up listening to all kinds of music, and I may be the first generation, you know, somebody who grew up in the 60s where the long playing record was suddenly making music from all over the world available. And uh, rather than reject it, which I think was the modernist 
point of view. I mean, it was what made Boulez Boulez or Cage Cage was was the sort of rejectionist thing. You know, well, somebody else has done that, so that doesn't come into my work, and this doesn't come into my work. And you eventually get a Jasper Johns white painting, right. you know, in which there's nothing on the canvas because everyone has been there already and planted a flag. And I felt that, you know, that was a reductionist aesthetic which didn't interest me and being the kind of person I am and being the kind of uh, artistic sensibility that I am, growing up in a family where Benny Goodman and Mozart were equivalent, I've made uh, a musical pedigree which is, as you say, it's a tremendously embracing one. For example, I just came back from Vienna where I premiered a new work and I was sliced and diced by the Viennese press who felt that my work was so full of artifacts that they thought they could recognize that, that it must therefore be a form of kitsch. Uh, you know, and it, it, is, it is an issue that Americans have in the world, but um, I think I would prefer to be an American composer now than any other nationality because I think our culture is so rich and whether you want to talk about kitsch or vulgarity or whatever, the, the bleed through between um, you know, the demotic culture, between pop culture or whatever you want to call it, and, and high, highbrow, lowbrow, is something that's constantly modulating in, in this country where we have you know, extreme tackiness <laughs> side by side with, with great imagination. Let's talk about the first, in your view, the first point in your career where there was a big bump up, where you got uh, real recognition. Well, I, I think that, you know, the the big leap in terms of, uh, of being recognized as a, you know, a, a major American composer was probably the premiere of Nixon in China, my, my opera. Uh, which I composed between 1985 and 1987, and it was premiered in uh, in late '87 in Houston, and the the mixture of uh, impetus in it was was very it was irresistible for uh, both the press and the public. You know, the idea of, first of all of an opera about Richard Nixon, <laughs> the fact that it would be some kind of minimalist opera and and have Mao Zedong in it was, you know, it it, <laughs> it it got a lot of attention. And for a while, I even thought uh, it was going to get too much attention. We had a we had a tryout with just two pianos in San Francisco, and in order to pay for it to bring the soloists in, um, we had to sell tickets. And it turned out that it sold out two nights in a row, and and a dozen critics came just to this piano tryout, and it was mentioned that night on the by Tom Brokaw on the NBC Nightly News. Uh -huh. So I knew that I I had this sort of hot potato. And, of course, when it was premiered finally, um, the press had a field day. Uh, my uh, favorite uh, <laughs> review came from the New York Times, a crabby old Donald Henahan, who said, uh, Mr. Adams has done for the arpeggio what McDonald's did for the hamburger. <laughs> I have attended many feasts, but never have I so enjoyed a dinner. Never have I so enjoyed a dinner, nor have I heard played better the music that I love of America. I move a boat of thanks. To one and all whose efforts made this possible. No one who heard could but admire your eloquent remarks, Premier. And billions more hear what we say through satellite technology than ever heard a public speech before. No one is out of touch. No one, no one, no one is out of touch. 
telecommunication has broadcast your message into space. Yet soon our words won't be recorded while what we do can change the world. We have at times been enemies. We still have differences, but wars. But let us, in these next five days, start a long march on new highways. In different ways, but parallel, and heading towards a single goal. The world watches and listens. We must seize the hour. 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 And seize the aware that you were going to raise some eyebrows by treating such a subject. Uh, of course, there was no more unpopular figure at the time than Richard Nixon. That was the first point in which you really started to focus on real issues of contemporary living in well, a serious way. Well, a lot of that had to do with, with my collaborator, Peter Sellers, uh, who's also had his formative years here in Boston. Mm -hmm. And we've both had to live with this tag that we write political works and and I resent that because I think that if I were a filmmaker or a novelist uh, and I wrote a novel or made a film about uh, a contemporary event people would assume that that's what you do I mean no one talks about John Lennon being a political songwriter but I mean his songs were all about what it's like to be alive right now and I feel that that's the same thing that I'm doing but with opera you know if you treat mythic figures from our contemporary life, then you get this tag of being a CNN opera or a docu-opera, which belittled the work. And in fact, I think Nixon in China is really about fundamental themes of our, our contemporary life, certainly of my life, because Nixon represented this belief that everything in life could be boil down to marketing principles and also this idea that American values were the right values and that we would go into the world and, and promote them. And we now, in this era of Iraq, know um, the casualties of that kind of, you know, Manichaean thinking. You've had a tremendous courage to pursue this course, I think. Uh, you got into incredible hot water with the death of Klinghopper, your second opera. Uh, did you anticipate as intense a reaction as you got to that? Well, I knew that it was going to be uh, an inflammatory subject because, um, you know, it, it involved uh, a, a subject that's very taboo in this country, um, which is the battle between the Palestinians and, and, and the Israelis. And we chose a story that was still an open wound, you know, the, the killing of this hijacked and, and handicapped American Jew, uh, Leon Klinghoffer. Right. And I, I suspected that it, that it would be very controversial. I didn't choose that subject in order to be controversial. I chose it because I thought <clears throat> it was an extraordinary story that everybody knew about, and that on the one hand, it, it, it was painfully contemporary, and alas, you know, 18 years after its composition, it's still painfully contemporary. But at the same time, it also felt like something that could be torn from Genesis or the book of Samuel or something. It had a very Old Testament feel to it. Israel. Israel. 
It's important to note that the death of Klinghoffer, a piece that treats both sides of a very, very complicated and painful issue as human beings with, with real concerns, causes a real fury because it's such a, a long-seated issue with such deep scar tissue. Well, you know, it's about terrorism. And, you know, terrorism is... It's it's so much a part of our, our contemporary life. I mean, fortunately, uh, with the exception of 9-11, Americans on the continent have not had to suffer it in the way that people in the Middle East uh, or in, right. in Asia have. But it... Um, I chose that topic because I, I felt that, that um, terrorism really goes to the core of, of our, our, our psychic course. hot buttons. And, um, you know, I felt that if you look, for example, at, at the passion story, you know, that mm -hmm. Bach said, um, one can easily transpose those kind of emotions, the violent hatred, and the uh, e the use of language, the talking of language, to to apply to our lives today, and so much of what we see, and so much of the mistrust and the hatred and, and misunderstanding and violence, um, is expressed through talking of language. Um, one side you have soldiers, and the other side you have militants. You know, <laughs> and it all is a way of using language to place yourself. And in what we did in Klinghoffer is we. We gave a voice to both the Jews and the Palestinians, and of course that was an outrageous affront in the minds of many people. You simply don't do that because the Palestinians are terrorists. Unfortunately, an issue that has remained inflamed right down to our own time. From Nixon and China on, it seems like the, the real big points in your career have been pieces that deal with some aspect of contemporary living in a very important way. One piece that you wrote that is out of the mainstream of classical music that I was quite taken by was your musical. I was looking at the ceiling and then I saw the sky about the San Francisco earthquake. What an image in a sentence that is about your world coming down around you. You indulged your popular side in, in that piece. Well, it was about the Northridge, California earthquake, which took place in uh, the mid-1980s. The San Francisco earthquake was 1906. But my mother had sung and acted in uh, local productions of South Pacific and, and Carousel, so I grew up being very much aware of uh, 
Broadway and the great tradition of Rodgers and Hammerstein and, and uh, Gershwin. And I always wanted to write a show. It was not a big success, unfortunately. It played around, uh, but it, it never got beyond sort of being an unusual art piece by a, a classical composer. But I'm very fond of the piece, and the recording that has Audra McDonald and, and right. a wonderful cast on it is one of my favorites. Well, it was out of genre for an already out of genre <laughs> composer, I That's guess, right. anyway. How far can I go in a car driven by a cop? How far can I go before the killer chill of our intimate situation? Before the thrust and thrill of our intimate investigation into murder, burglary, false alarm, drug bust, and domestic altercations overcome our actual easy palpitations overcome the actual and natural charm of riding side by side riding in a car riding in a car driven by a cop and then we have El Nino and this was such a a departure for you in the treatment of a sacred subject. Uh, why did you decide to do that? Well, I'd always loved Messiah uh, since I was a kid, and I had an impetus to compose my own Messiah. You know, I'm not a churchgoer. I did go to the Unitarian Church as a kid, and I was uh, very taken by some of the principal archetypical myths of Christianity. And I was um, offered several commissions around the millennium. So I put them together, and I made this sort of multi-purpose work called El Nino, which is my retelling of the nativity, uh, which can be a fully staged opera or it can be just a straight concert oratorio. My spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior, for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. I wanted to um, tell the nativity story largely from the point of view of women. Uh, I know that's presumptuous on my part, not being a woman, but I felt that it's the story of birth uh, and the traditional cantatas, whether they be by Bach or, or Handel or Telemann, uh, are presumably from a man's point of view. Mary labored and gave birth. There you have it. <laughs> but anyone who's uh, you know been the father of a child and and seen a wife go through pregnancy and all the the changes uh, knows that there's more to it than that. So again, with my longtime collaborator Peter Sellers, we assembled a libretto. Um, much of the text is written by women, and in a wonderful twist. Uh, Peter suggested that many of these uh, texts come from Latin America. And my living in California, I, I immediately loved that idea. And I realized it was time for me to master Spanish. Hmm. And so uh, El Nino is this wonderful mix of texts that has the traditional Luke and Isaiah and things uh, side by side with marvelous poems by Hispanic women, which I said in Spanish. A remarkable thing about El Nino, uh, coming from a composer who has an ambiguous relationship to religion, is that it expresses very well the faith and the doubt, and that is connects it so powerfully to Bach, who, for all his very passionate Lutheran faith, was so good at expressing the doubt in devastating ways. It, was that a conscious part of your effort to connect to Bach in that way? I, I don't know. I mean, once I got into the piece, I stopped worrying about the models. What's wonderful about it is um, getting into these poems by women. 
Um, my favorite poem is by Rosario Castellanos, the great Mexican poet, who has a poem about being pregnant and about feeling ugly and feeling that this thing growing inside her, this being, is robbing her of her color and her blood and her, and her energy. But the moment uh, when the baby actually arrives in the world, she realizes that her solitude has been taken away. And this marvelous image that no longer does she look at the world through a window pane, but now she's open to the winds and to the presence. And it's, it just gives me goose pimples just to, to think about it. Then, along comes a commission from the New York Philharmonic Orchestra to write a piece, and what more painful contemporary issue could there be than the uh, 9-11 catastrophe? They asked you to write it for the... the uh, first anniversary. Yeah. Right, the first anniversary. Was there a big flap about the fact that the New York Philharmonic asked this uh, California composer to write a piece about 9-11, which was such a New York thing. Uh, I don't remember there being a flap. I mean, the big flap was inside of me because I, you know, I wondered how anyone could write a work that close uh, to the event without it being just an embarrassment. Christina Flannery, Lucy Fishman. Richard Sibley, Lucy Fishman. Richard Stina Flannery. John Richard Fitzsimmons. John Richard Fitzsimmons. Christina Flannery, John Flory, David Flory, Joseph W. Flory, David Flory, John, Joseph W. Flory, Helen D. Cook, Joseph W. Flory, John, Helen D. Cook, Christina Flannery, Joseph W. Flory, Helen D. Cook, Christina Flannery, Carl Flory, Carl Flory, Carl On the other hand, I felt that it was a request from uh, people in New York who had suffered this and the New York Philharmonic who had done a lot. Uh, you know, they'd gone down to the ground zero and played for the workers there. And so I took, I took the request very seriously. Fortunately, I had a guardian angel when I wrote this piece, which, who was Charles Ives. Um, mm. I felt that Ives... I always asked myself, what, uh, what would Ives have done in this situation? And in the end, I incorporated his famous unanswered question into the piece. And um, I focused basically on the sense of loss. The piece is not political in any sense. It just simply is about the intimacy of the individuals, um, you know, what it's like to be a father and discover that your son is not going to come home, or a lover who's... You know, things just finally got going and we're thinking of getting married and all of a sudden, it's gone. Betsy Martinez. Brian McKee. Christopher Laub. Daniel Mayer. Dennis Lavelle. The Transmigration of Souls. So, Charles Ives is where you've really arrived, it seems. Your most recent recording is My Father Knew Charles Ives. And if it wasn't John Adams, I would think, oh, somebody's being fanciful here, but 
you are always very confessional, autobiographical in, in your work. So I knew, wow, his father yes, and, really did know Charles And, of course, Hyde. my father didn't know Charles Hyde. He didn't? No. <laughs> oh, but, but you're being fanciful. Yes, but it's a fun title because my father could have known Charles Hyde. I mean, they they were very similar people. And my relationship to my father was very much like Ives was to his father. I mean, I learned music from my father. We played in bands together. And I also imbued transcendental philosophy and Whitman and Thoreau from my father the way that Charles Ives did. We were both born and grew up in New England. So it's it's a fanciful title, but um, the piece also is a very loving evocation of, of my childhood. The first movement's called Concord, but of course mm-hmm. it means Concord, New Hampshire. And the second movement uh, is called The Lake, which applies to Lake Winnipesaukee. And the third is called The Mountain, uh, of which I spent a lot of time climbing mountains in New Hampshire. So I suppose one could call the piece Three Places in New England, only a little further north. 
I think I would prefer to be an American composer now than any other nationality because I think our culture is so rich and the bleed through between the demotic culture, between pop culture, whatever you want to call it, and highbrow, lowbrow is something that's constantly modulating in this country, whereas in Europe it's rigid and fixed. An American portrait. Composer John Adams, who in his own words and music has illustrated his extraordinary trajectory from a San Francisco underground minimalist to one of the most important creators in the world of opera topical to our times. Our engineers are Jane Pippick and Alan Mattis. Invaluable production assistance came from Cameron Kirkpatrick. Thanks to the Boston Symphony Orchestra for lending us Mr. Adams during his latest visit. This profile is a special production of WGBH Radio Boston. I'm producer Richard Nisley.